I finally finished reviewing the Cetus Mark III. It's a really quirky machine with some great strengths, but also some significant weaknesses. I've had this printer for review for quite some time now, so I'd like to start by issuing an apology to tea time for the extended time frame. But as you'll see in this video, there are some things that did hold me up. I agreed to review this printer for two main reasons. Firstly, it's available from an Australian warehouse, and I know quite often my local viewers are frustrated because I can't easily get a hold of the things that I feature on the channel. Secondly, I know Angus from Maker's Muse is a big fan of this printer, so I wanted to see what all the fuss was about. He has a video reviewing this Mark III, plus a comparison with the earlier Mark I and Mark II models. It's really worth checking out to get another perspective. My review is a little bit mixed, so we'll start it out by looking at the machine specs. The Cetus Mark III, as the name suggests, is the third iteration of this printer from Tier Time, which you might know from the UP series of 3D printers. It comes in a standard model, which is 180 millimeters cubed for the build volume, and an extended version, which has the same X and Y, but extends the Z axis up to 280 millimeters. Its main claim to fame is precision, and that's thanks to the linear rails and guides on all axes. To aid with this, it has nine point matrix leveling for the bed and calibration in the slicer to get the dimensions spot on. One thing I really like are three different nozzle sizes that ship with the printer and are easy to change. And it is meant to support a variety of materials, but this asterisk here is particularly important because by default it ships without a heated bed and that means you're pretty much limited to PLA only. There are a range of upgrades available for the Mark III, such as a heated bed, auto bed leveling probe, hardened steel nozzle for abrasive materials, touchscreen control for offline printing, and very interestingly, an open source CPU to convert the printer to smoothieware. Without this, however, all of the software is proprietary, but it does make some pretty big claims about being easy to use. In the configuration I'm testing here, the official price for this printer is 379 US dollars. However, you will find it cheaper on the Amazon store. Despite listing these optional upgrades, I can't seem to find a way to buy them on the official tier time store, but once again, they are available for sale on Amazon. For me, the linear rails and the accuracy that should come with it was a main selling point. So I was keen to get testing. Assembly was fairly straightforward. I give the instructions about a seven out of 10. They were mostly descriptive, but some aspects such as the screws for the bed were unclear. On top of the bed assembly, whether I was meant to put something on top of this surface to cover those screws was another mystery, but it turns out this is the way it's meant to be. It's got a special texture and some sort of adhesive for the prints to stick to, assuming you use a raft. I noticed this printer was peculiar in its construction. It has some high quality parts like the linear rails and blocks, but it also has a lot of 3D printed parts with some sections not really so rigid. It also has a belt instead of a lead screw for the Z axis, so when the power is turned off, it will drop down, albeit slowly at least. All of the software for this is proprietary, and that was initially a big problem for me because I couldn't get it to install. I tested the suggestions from support to no avail, and the printer sat idle for quite a while, waiting for an update that was compatible with my computer to be released. You have to make an account, which I don't really like. And after this, I tried to set up the Wi-Fi, which was straightforward, but you should know you can only connect to this printer wirelessly if your computer is on the same Wi-Fi network or SSID. For me, my main computer is connected via ethernet. For everyone else using a laptop, as far as I can tell, the Wi-Fi feature works really well on this printer. I commenced printing with one of these sample rolls, which I hung precariously off this rather elaborate separate filament holder that you need to construct from the included extrusion pieces. I'm not a fan of the non-spooled filament, which was confirmed when it tangled and jammed. And here's where I came across the first major problem with this printer, and that's removing the prints from this print bed. The raft added by the slicer works really well to the point where the included scraper is pretty much useless at getting it off. I did find a workaround, however, by using this small squared scalpel to pry underneath the edge, and then it pops off surprisingly easy after that. After this, I printed to a roll of normal PLA on a proper spool, and I started with a humble 20 millimeter calibration cube. The test cube is fairly well formed, but it does suffer from fairly obvious ringing. 
Next up, I loaded up the ubiquitous 3D Benchy to see how that looked. And once again, I found it printed quite well, again with some ringing. A common problem with benches that I print is that the lack of cooling on the underside of the nose leaves the surface a little bit lumpy. This one doesn't suffer from that, but it does have a little bit of wispiness from some stringing. I wanted to test out bars mode, but unfortunately the proprietary UpStudio slicer does not support it, which I verified by Googling the tea time support forums. You can still print with a single thin wall, but you're not gonna have the speed advantages that bars mode normally gives. This one turned out not too bad, the shape was reproduced faithfully, I accidentally turned on support, and because it's delicate, it makes it even more difficult to remove from the raft. My next print was this car, designed by one of my students to be a prize for some younger kids. Once again, it printed quite well. The only real problem I can see is some minor ringing on the flat surfaces. Now, speaking of rafts, it was proving extremely difficult to remove the rafts from these prints. On the car, it was possible, but it definitely wasn't straightforward. I found a setting for easy peel in the slicer and I applied that from the prints from now on. I initially tried to print this chain mail as a tolerance test and it looks like it was doing quite well, but there's no filament run out detection. So when this one ran out, that was the end of that. I then switched to this much quicker to print flexi snake model and this one turned out really well. The direct drive extruder does a really good job of all these minor details and the print in place design articulates beautifully even as I pull off the raft. And since the raft was peeling off, that means that easy peel option is pretty much a must for the filament that I was using. Normally in a 3D printer review, I would take it through a full range of materials, but since we don't have a heated bed, that meant no PETG and no ABS. I still could, however, try some flexibles. I loaded up the classic Flexi Octopus in TPU, and it appeared that it had printed quite well, but as I tried to separate the raft, it started to disintegrate a little. It's definitely flexible, but the structural integrity leaves a lot to be desired. Still, I'm a little bit surprised that it printed at all, because there is a gap above and below the extruder. I expected maybe the filament to buckle and try and head sideways out of there, and maybe it would with a softer type of TPU. One thing that I do really like about this printer is that it comes with two spare nozzles in different sizes. The default nozzle is 0.4 millimeters, but it also comes with a 0.6 as well as a 0.2 for precision work. Although there was no instructions for it, I found them very easy to change. You heat up the nozzle, use the included wrench, simply unscrew one and screw on the next one. And there's a single option to select in the software before everything is reconfigured. I was keen to print something fairly big versus the print volume quite quickly, so I picked out this dice tower. I also selected this X3D Smooth PLA, which seems to be like the beautiful polyalkamer elixir filament that I've seen in other videos, except locally available and at a reasonable price. On my first print of this, it experienced a layer shift while doing the raft. I stopped it, removed it, started it again, and the exact same thing happened. This time I let it go, figuring that it would correct itself, and it did for the most part. One edge wasn't supported, and that's made the raft a little bit mangled and difficult to remove. The overall shape is there, but there is pretty severe ringing over the entire print. There's also additional layer shifts up at the top of the castle. This one was done at 0.3 millimeter layer height and took about seven and a half hours, which is pretty good for a model of this size. The real highlight for me was the shimmer of this smooth PLA. So I decided to stick with it, but this time go a different direction and fit the smaller nozzle for some miniatures. My first print with the 0.2 millimeter nozzle was this miniature castle at 0.15 millimeter layer height. The raft separated cleanly and everything is nicely formed, except once again, we have the same ringing on the flat surfaces. With a small nozzle and a direct drive extruder, I decided to push this thing as far as it could go. So I printed this miniature tabletop dwarf and it was at only 0.05 millimeter layer height. And for the first time, I bumped the print quality from standard up to fine. This thing was buried in support to take care of all the overhangs. And I was worried about how easy that would be to remove, but fortunately, it really wasn't too bad. Now the quality of this is not quite as good as resin printing, but for an FDM printer, using pre-made slicing profiles for the fine nozzle, it's pretty outstanding. There is a little bit of wispiness, and I think that could be cleaned up pretty quickly with a hairdryer. Apart from that, all of the little features and details seem to be included, and the model even feels fairly strong as well. My final test print was this miniature Schnauzer, again on fine print quality, but with the layer height bumped up to 0.1 millimeters. I backed off the supports a little bit for this one, and they did collapse, 
but it didn't really affect the final object. And I'd have to say this is probably my favorite print on this machine. The round surfaces hide any ringing if there was any evident in the first place. Overall, especially thanks to this PLA smooth filament, it's just a beautiful, beautiful little print. So that was my printing and overall, what do I think about this thing? Well, I said my review was mixed and that's because it's full of highs as well as lows. This is a machine of contradiction. It has precise linear rails, but then it has minimal attachments with a degree of flex. It has a bed where prints always stick, but that takes extra time filament and requires additional post-processing. The main reason for the contention is the proprietary slicing software. So let's talk about that a little bit more in detail. If you've used other 3D printers, you're gonna find it most unusual. For instance, Z Home's at the top, and I found the leveling particularly unintuitive as you manually increment the print head down until it's just above the bed and then memorize this number to input elsewhere. Something really strange for me is that there's no home button anywhere on the interface. Instead, you have the printer initialize. And that seems to reset the whole thing, including homing, but it does take a good 30 seconds or so. The filament loading and unloading is a little bit frustrating because you click the button and then it heats up, does the extrusion or retraction instantly. And if you're not in the room watching it like a hawk, you've missed your opportunity. You've got to click the button and wait for it to happen again. The pre-made slicing profiles are pretty close to the money, but we do have that ringing. So perhaps the acceleration values are a little bit too fast. It is extremely easy to change between different nozzles and materials, yet it doesn't include vase mode. There's also a help section, which should be great, except the articles are for the up minis instead of the Cetus. Probably the most frustrating thing about this software that will be so easy to fix is that it's hard to learn what all of the different features are because there's no tool tips. Being able to hover the mouse above something and have a prompt as to what it means would help so, so much. This thing is so close to being an excellent beginner-friendly 3D printer, but these few compromises kind of muddy the waters a little bit. After you work out how to negotiate things like separating the print from the print bed and working out how to get the rafts to easy peel, it's probably pretty close to still being beginner-friendly. After my test printing, the main strength of this printer versus other ones I've reviewed is probably with the fine nozzle printing miniatures. The quality of these prints is simply amazing, especially when you consider I've had to do no slicer tweaking and everything is pre-configured. At this price, the printer is not exactly cheap and that raises the point of competitors. During my review period, Prusa announced the Prusa Mini. It's very similar to this printer in construction with a moving bed on the Y axis, a cantilevered X axis, and even a similar build volume. Furthermore, it comes with a LCD and auto bed leveling from standard and comes in cheaper than this. Like a lot of people, I ordered mine fairly quickly and I expect to see it before the end of the year. It will be interesting to see how these two printers compare and I look forward to testing them back to back. If you've got any thoughts or comments on this printer or maybe one of the up mini printers from Tier Time, please leave them in the comments below. Thank you so much for watching and until next time, happy 3D printing. G'day, it's Michael again. If you liked the video, then please click like. If you want to see more content like this in future, click subscribe and make sure you click on the bell to receive every notification. If you really want to support the channel and see exclusive content, become a patron. Visit my Patreon page. See you next time.